That's me with him. Morris was an incurable romantic. He had his first job at 15 with Rolls Royce, making copper piping. As a young kid, I worshipped Morris. I loved his smell, his laugh, everything about him. Then as a teenager, I became more rebellious and questioning. I never really appreciated Morris's photography, which I thought glamorized industry in a romantic and unrealistic way. Our relationship got somewhat better when Barney, my son, was born, and we had a family tradition of doing our portraits on the same bench each year. I do remember, though, Morris being quite critical of my work when I became a filmmaker. We had such different styles. Morris's work was beautifully crafted. Mine was much more chaotic. He thought me unappreciative of all he had done, as well as thinking my work was too confrontational. We were very different. We went through a period of being very critical of each other. It took time for us to enjoy our differences and appreciate each other's work. We were lucky that we had that opportunity. My father died aged 94. And even though we'd become the best of friends by then, there was still so much I didn't know about him. So many questions I just hadn't asked. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, he will be in a few minutes, he told me. Ah, okay. Mă bucur foarte mult că am putut să cât așteptăm, vreau să spun câteva cuvinte, mă bucur foarte mult că am putut să proiectăm filmul ăsta al unic, care e foarte recent. Um, pentru uh, seria pe care o fac, Portrete de maestri, o viață în documentar, um, este cea mai bună introducere. Um, vă dă un sens al carierei lui și cu clipurile pe care le vom arăta, vom duce lucrurile un pic mai departe, în mai mult detaliu și vom discuta despre filozofia lui de lucru, despre cariera lui, despre deciziile pe care le-a luat ca regizor și despre felul în care a creat acest stil inconfundabil, stilul Nick Broomfield, care a devenit un fel de gen de documentar în sine însuși. Foarte mulți regizori au fost influențați de asta și unul dintre cei mai cunoscuți este... Michael Moore, pe care probabil că, pe care probabil că știți. Îl așteptăm pe Nick. Ok. Hello. Can you hear me, Nick? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. We just seen um, My Father and Me, such a beautiful film. And what better introduction to a life in documentaries masters than your beautiful film about your life in documentaries and your personal life. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, thank you very much, Nick, for joining us. Um, a life in documentary um, aims to celebrate the best in documentary, and Nick Broomfield is certainly one of the very best in the world. 
one of the very few documentary directors who truly deserves to be recognized as a star. Um, Thank you so well, much for joining. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say before we start how sad I am not to be with you. Um, I unfortunately got the, this dreaded uh, COVID, which I've managed to successfully avoid right till now. And I was so excited to come. I read all about uh, Cebu and its history, and I read some of the literature that has come out of... Uh, Romania in the last few years. Uh, so I'm very, very disappointed not, not to be with you, and I hope uh, that I'll get to meet you all another time. Um, but, and, and I'm delighted to see you now and to talk about the films, and thank you very much for coming. We're delighted to see you too, Nick, and I'm glad that we found a way. Um, now, um, you've been making films for five decades. That's half a century of history. Right of capturing history, <laughs> the history of our times, um, in films that are very thought-provoking and daring and entertaining. Um, and these films achieve a rather rare thing, I think. Um, they are equally worth making and commercially successful. Um, and um, you approached your subjects in a large variety of ways, but eventually these approaches were distilled in a very recognizable style. You created a very distinct documentary style, which I dare say has become a documentary genre in itself. And my plan tonight is to show clips from some of your films that mark pivotal moments in your fantastic career. And um, it would be great to discuss them with you so that our audience can get a sense of how you developed as a filmmaker, how you created your very personal, very recognizable style, and um, to learn a little bit about your philosophy as a director. Um, and after our conversation, we will open the floor to questions. Um, but before we dive into the film clips, I just want to ask you, Nick, um, what was the first documentary that you ever saw? Um, when did you become aware of documentary as a genre of film? I, I guess the, the first documentaries that I really loved were the uh, kind of more observational films. I loved the films of Fred Wiseman. I found them to be both incredibly informative and very entertaining. I loved his early films. And I also loved the films of Penny Baker. Um, and I remember particularly loving the film he did about Bob Dylan. Uh, don't Look Back in, I guess it was 65, which was both an amazing portrait of, of Dylan and his music and the kind of person he was at that time, as well as uh, a great portrait of Britain at that time and the, all the other characters. It was uh, an eye-opener for me because most of the sort of traditional BBC documentaries at that point had been very dry and very... Uh, you know, uh, they were very informative, but they weren't much fun to watch. And so I, I felt, well, you know, this is an incredible form. It's, uh, it's a form that can entertain. It's a film that can show people a different part of the world that they don't know. Um, and I just kind of fell in. Sorry, we've, we've lost the sound there for a a, a oh. fraction of a second. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Can we hear you now? Can you say something? Just okay, yes. yes that's can. fine. We, it's back. Can you hear? Oh, great. Yeah, just great. the last few words. Um, so how did you get into documentaries? You, were, you went to the National Film School, and I believe you were the first generation of students at the National Film School. Yeah, but before that, I was, I was at university. I was studying law, and uh, I was in a place called Cardiff in uh, Wales, actually. And uh, I was living in an amazing part of Cardiff called Tiger Bay, which is where all the docks were and where hundreds of different kinds of uh, races lived. It was an amazing place. And it was being knocked down and the docks were closing down. And I thought it would be great to make a film there. And uh, in Wales, the thing that they most care about and love is, is playing rugby. So the Rugby Society had this, the only film camera, a, a wind-up Bolex, a beautiful camera, 
and I managed to persuade them to borrow it for a couple of months. And it was just when film was changing and black and white was going out, and color was coming in. So you could get short ends of black and white film from, and I gathered all these short ends of film and made this film about uh, Cardiff. And um, it was about the people that I'd met. It was kind of a love story to their life and, and the city and how it was changing when the houses were being knocked down and people were being moved to the outskirts of the cities, which is a very common thing. So I, I made that. It, it then was, it took me like almost two years, I think, to cut an 18-minute film. Uh, but I learned a lot. And then um, when I graduated from university, I then applied to the National Film School and sh showed this film, which is kind of what got me a place. So I kind of started just, you know, making a film myself, which I think is great for people to start. You know, it's like, you, sometimes it's great to make a film before you go to film school, just to make sure that that's really what you want to do. And what was your experience of the film school? Um, what did you learn in the film school? What, 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 what does the philosophy of the National Film School in those days? Well, the philosophy of the film school uh, of, with Colin Young, he was very influenced by the teaching of A.S. Neal, which is he loved completely unstructured education. There, was, there were no classes. It was very much, there was a heap of cameras the best cameras you could get and sound equipment. We were given rudimentary instructions how to use them. And then everyone was supposed to go off and make their films. And the, the philosophy of the film school was uh, trial and error. It was go out, make lots of mistakes and learn from your mistakes. So it, it was a, a wonderfully unstructured education. And, and that was, I think, very much Colin's philosophy. Then he would look at what you've done and he would go through the storytelling, you know, and Colin Young, who was a great storyteller. And so he, he would, he looked at films rather like books and he would sort of say, well, I think, you know, sometimes you'd spent months and months editing a film and he'd then decide, you know, the end should really be at the beginning and the, be and the middle should be, you know, he could be very frustrating, but he really had a process. And, and you learn that a lot of the art of filmmaking is the way you tell a story and the way you organize yourself is around that principle as, as well. So it, it was a wonderful way to learn that. I either read somewhere or I saw it somewhere. Um, uh, he was saying that um, he wanted to put on the frontispiece of the National Film School Heraclitus sort of quote, it's not possible to step in the same river twice. Um, <laughs> uh, did that have anything to do with the style that he was trying to promote, the observational kind of film? I, I think that um, Colin really believed in the power of documentary was the moment. He loved that it was raw, it was spontaneous, and that was th the truthfulness about it. Um, he really didn't like things that were staged or, you know, pretend documentaries. He, he loved that moment. He loved shooting in long takes uh, with a minimum of editing. Um, he wanted documentaries to be the way of understanding other communities and other places and the way other people spoke. Uh, so it was a kind of almost a respect for different worlds that we didn't know very much about. And that was very much what he taught us. And he taught us to shoot in groups of two. So we tried to get students to, you know, find someone else to work with who could think the same way that they did. Which I think, you know, often finding the right partner when you're uh, starting out making films uh, is the most important thing. Um, I was very lucky. I met Joan Churchill when I was there, who had been a student of Collins too. And we started making films together. Uh, and it was very much following Collins' teaching, for, certainly for the first few films. 
That leads us nicely into the first clip that I want to show, which is um, a clip from behind the rent strike. Um, and, and it's that moment when you speak to um, one of your contributors who also become your, became your friend, Ethel. Um, do you want to say a few words about this film just before we play the clip? Well, yeah, I, I think what was interesting was, you know, I was obviously a pretty middle class kid and uh, pretty uh, naive and uh, politically uneducated. And Ethel ran this enormous tenants group and was very, uh, was a great orator. And she, she was a very modest kind of housewife in one way. And then she was a very sophisticated politician in another. We liked each other, but I think Ethel was the person who taught me, uh, well, who kind of dragged me into the reality of her life. Uh, in a very affectionate way, but sometimes slightly impatient. You know, she was like, she couldn't believe some of the things I said and uh, felt that I was, um, you know, politically very naive. And I felt that this was a great thing to have in the film. I felt that this was typical of so many filmmakers, which is you come often from very different backgrounds to the people you're making the films about. And if you really want to understand those people, you sometimes need to look at the differences between you. So I decided to put this bit into the beginning of the film. It was very, a sort of very personal thing, really. It's the first time that you put yourself in a film as a character, although we don't see you in the clip, but um, this, would, this was the first step that later on became your very distinguishable style, because um, afterwards you made observational documentaries for a while. So, but let's see the clip. Um, it, let's play clip number one. Don't think anything about it. You can come in, you'll make it, and it will have no effect. Like I've just said, it'll make people think for a few minutes, and that's all. But the position of the working class won't change. It won't change by you making a film, or for that matter, any other way. Filmmaker coming in, it just won't make any difference. Be dozens of filmmakers we've seen on local estates. And Why do you think I'm making it? I'm asking you that. Why are you making it? It's only personal self-satisfaction. That's all that it must be. Now, can you get the injustice of it all unless you actually feel deeply enough about it? And the only way to feel deeply enough about it is for it to be bloody well happening to you. And it's not happening to you. Because at the end of the three months, you know, you can go back home. Um, I love this clip, um, and I love the <laughs> cinematic kind of tracking shot with the kids running. That's such a beautiful shot. Um, mm. But I, I like it because it raises some sort of really important questions that probably um, you kind of tried to answer throughout your career. Um, why do you make a film? Um, what are the results of making a film? Um, do we really have as filmmakers the capacity to really understand what we're filming? And um, finally, the whole le legitimacy of making a film on a certain subject. And this sort of short clip just kind of captures all this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what made you want to um, show your relationship with Ethel uh, and make it part of the film? Well, I thought we had a very interesting relationship because I learned so much from Ethel. And one of the things I've always loved about making films is that you learn so much from people who are very different from you. You know, filmmaking is like a passport to different worlds. And you have a very, I think, incredibly lucky education, which is you learn firsthand from all these people who you would never normally meet if you weren't a filmmaker uh, because they teach you about their lives. They teach you 
about what they've been through uh, that has created who they are. In a way, you know, I mean, other people, I guess, read books. And as filmmakers, you film it and you become part of the people's lives. And yes, it's true, you're only there for three months. But I, you, I have so many friendships from uh, the years that I've been making films with people, you know, I mean, from people who I would never normally have met, you know, at all. And they're, they're really dear friends and they call up and uh, I think that's kind of the thing that I hold closest to my heart, really, are those relationships. And somebody like Ethel was so much an example of that, you know, a woman who couldn't have been more different, probably, from the way I grew up, and yet we had a real friendship. You know, people sometimes, you know, after they'd seen their clips, it's, did she really hate you? Well, actually, no. And and I used to stay in her house always. And, you know, she fed me when I was up there. And, you know, we, I remember when I was uh, going, leaving England for a while, I, they had my car for a couple of years. So it was a, there was a deep friendship. And I'm friends with her kids now. And she actually died uh, a couple of years ago. And I went up for the funeral. Um, and we we're still all very, very close. So I, I think, you know, filmmaking too, is it's not just dropping into people's lives. It's something that you keep with you. And did that film have any effect on, after it was shown? I mean, it was your graduation film. It, w it was my graduation film. I, I think it, um, it then goes on to examine this uh, rent strike that was happening in a place called Kirby. Um, and well, I think it it certainly brought the demands of the rent strike people home. Um, I think you know it, it showed the kind of conditions that they were uh, fighting against, and I think it created a lot of sympathy. I don't think you know there's obviously very different kinds of films. Some films I've made some films which have, for example, changed the sentencing procedures in. A couple of prisons, or um, sometimes you make a film which is as an appeal for somebody who's facing some form of imprisonment, which is a very specific kind of film. But very often, I think films create information for people who don't know so much about a particular world. You know, they inform people and they bring the joy and love of, of particular people um, to you that you would never normally meet. I think that's what film has, has the ability of introducing you to people that other, other medium don't really have. I wanted to show a, a clip from um, Juvenile Liaison, but then it is the same clip that appears in, in the film that we've just seen, so I'm going to skip that uh, clip and go straight to Soldier Girls um, as an example of your observational work. Um, so if we could pl okay. uh, play clip number three. Knock them out. 
Get your butt back. Get it down. Try it again, young lady. Don't dust it off. Get your hands to your side. Now try it again. One side. Dust them legs right there. Straight back. Two sides. Get your legs way back. Three sides. Like a tight Four sizes. Now cover up. Move it now. Cover up. Come on, move it out. Five sizes. Cover. Six sizes. Seven sizes. Eight cover. Eight sizes. Five sizes. Keep moving around. Nine sizes. That was a perfect cover. Fourteen sizes. Fifteen sizes. Is it still funny, Private Tuggy? Get that thumb down along and see that trouser. You still think that is funny, Private Tuggy? No, Sergeant. Well, get that head square with your shoulder. Say something, Tootin. Say something! Stand her all damn days, don't bother us, Private. Well, Private Tootie, we are waiting on you. The whole Sergeant, is waiting on you. Sergeant, Private Two requests permission to cover, recover. Request permission to carry on. You're already recovered. You're already recovered, young lady. What have I done? You get your head squared, you get the squared. No, no, no! Sergeant! Private Tootin requests permission to carry on! Get back here, Tootin! Back here! You keep walking your way, go back here! Come here! No matter what little pains, what little aches you've got, you keep them to yourself. They do not influence any of my military formations. You understand me, Private? Yes, Sergeant. You start acting like a soldier and looking like one nut crying all over the damn place and getting a little case of the ass when somebody gets on you about something, Private. I wasn't crying because of that, Sergeant. If you're crying because of the pain, you stifle that too. I'm not crying because then of the pain. What either. is it, Tootin? Nothing. I just cry. Sergeant! Sergeant! You keep keeping your little eyes at me, young lady, and I'll have you back in the dirt. I don't need your little sarcasm and I don't want it. You do not display any emotion in uniform, Private. Any emotion. You understand me? Yes, Sergeant. Now, when I tell you to move out somewhere, young lady, it's at a double time. You do not walk back to me or to any other NCO in this company when you were called. You understand that, too? Yes, Sergeant. So when I tell you to join my platoon, all I ever better see is those little feet of yours moving as quick as they can in that direction. You understand that, Private? Yes, Sergeant. Well, we'll find out. Move, young lady. Such a powerful scene. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you approached this story in terms of the way it was filmed? And yes, well, I think it's uh, you know it was shot by Joan Churchill, uh, and it was very much the observational style that uh, Colin Young got us to uh, film. Uh, very long takes, very little editing. And so you see, you really understand how a f scene has built up and what has happened. Uh, and you're almost as the audience, you're transported to that place. It doesn't just show you the sort of beginning and the result, which is what you so often see in films. You actually see the transformation of, uh, you know, in this case, Private Tutton into a kind of, you know, complete mess as she's being... Uh, disciplined by the sergeants and you get a sense of the way the military works in you know uh, dealing with people and that kind of particular form of discipline and uh, I think it was 
you know, this kind of filming is actually quite difficult to do because uh, you can't get people to repeat things. Uh, and Joan had previously filmed a, a very, very big series on American television called The American Family, which was uh, a series that went on for a couple of years. So she had had a massive amount of experience of just shooting, shooting, shooting all day long for months and months on end. And uh, she was very uh, fluent with her camera work, you know, and, and I think she captures this scene so beautifully. Um, and uh, I think it was very much this kind of film that Conan Young so championed. And uh, I think, you know, it's a pity we don't see more observational films of this kind, really, on television and so on. It's, uh, it's all very much, much, very fast cutting and that kind of thing. But when we were making the film, we really became very much a part of that particular group of, of women in a place called Fort Gordon. And we were there for months and months and months. And we went through basic training pretty much with them. Um, and uh, we f were filming every day. So we built very, very close relationships. And, uh, and that really comes out in the film. You know, you really get a sense of who these girls were and where they came from, what their hopes were for their lives. And and also you got to know the drill sergeants as well. You know, some of the drill sergeants came across as kind of uh, sadistic bullies at the beginning. And then by the end of the film, you saw a different side it, to them and you understood more where they were coming from and what... So it was a very, uh, it was a very profound experience making the film. Uh, I think we were down in Georgia for uh, well, well over four months making it, um, and you know we lived in the barracks and so on. So uh, yeah, it was a profound experience, and uh, I, I think you know that scene is a real great example of Jones' cinematography. Yeah, I mean, the film captures this brutal brutality of the army, um, but then the fact that you understand that it's a necessity, it's like, it's, it, it has so much value. And also, this kind of contradictory portraits that are, are very often appear in your film, sort of you, someone who appears to be something, and then you kind of discover that there's something completely different. The sergeant here, the story has it that um, was an inspiration for Stanley Kubrick's sergeant in a full metal jacket. Mm. <laughs> um, we are going to go to uh, the next clip, um, which is from a film called Driving Me Crazy. Um, and uh, it's one of my favorite films of yours. Um, and it changed everything. I mean, from observational, you kind of turn to a completely different style. And if you, if you just kind of say, want to say a few words about sort of what, about this mm. film. Well, I, um, I was asked to to do a film about this musical. Um, and it, as soon as I got to New York, it was, it was, there was this wonderfully flamboyant producer called Andrew Brownsburg, who'd done a number of films with uh, Polanski and also with Morrissey, who was part of the Andy Warhol kind of factory. Um, and he used to refer to himself as Old Silvertongue because he could persuade people to do anything. And he had managed to get quite a lot of money to do a film uh, about this Broadway show. Uh, but he, it, was, it was quite apparent that there was no real story, um, although he was talking about a script. And um, then the financiers started kind of fighting with each other and fighting with Andrew. And I got very concerned about the chaos and I said to Andrew, if you allow me to film everything, I'll continue with the film. I want to film your discussions with the financiers and uh, the arguments we are having with the actors. And I, I want to do a sort of an experiment of making a different kind of film, which would be kind of almost a diary of the experience of shooting the film, rather than it just being ostensibly about this Broadway show. And Andrew agreed to that. And um, 
I when I when I made the film, I was quite influenced by uh, a film that I'd seen called Waiting for Fidel. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, it's, beautiful, beautiful film. It's a beautiful film where someone goes to Cuba to meet with uh, Fidel Castro. Um, and they, in fact, never meet Fidel Castro, but it's a wonderful portrait of uh, Cuba and also of the kind of frustrations of this filmmaker. And um, I felt that it was, uh, you know, and also I think there was that wonderful film uh, called Sherman's March by Ross McElwee. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. Which was ostensibly about uh, Sherman's March across uh, the United States, but it was also very much a film about Ross McElwee's love affairs across the United States. So it's a kind of beautiful, funny film that told you lots of different things. Um, so I set out to do something kind of along that line, for a really big departure in which I would be a character in it as much as Andrew the producer was a character in it. Um, and sometimes I learned, uh, you know, as, as with life, is when you take a really big risk, it pays off and you discover something you never would have discovered and it leads you into a whole avenue of filmmaking that you had never really anticipated before. And Driving Me Crazy was a very special film for me in this way, which is it showed me uh, a way of storytelling that I hadn't really realized before. Great. Let's see clip number five. Uh, go to clip number five, please, Philip. At our first meeting in Vienna, Andre had described himself as a collector of people. He is especially interested in the audition process and wants our film to be a record of it. Andre arranges for some of the acts we have missed to be called back. As usual, chaos surrounds the filming. after an hour and a half. He has to go and meet a couple of journalists. We carry on filming, but the remaining singers and performers start to ask whether they're auditioning for the film or for the show. We have stupidly sailed into a major deception and made a bad situation worse by being so disorganized. I am not if temperamental. You've got 35 people waiting around for two and a half hours, and it's not just about the film. You have to be considerate of these people's time and energy. These are dreams. You don't fuck with dreams. These people are here because they want a job. They believe in what they're here for. Do not waste their time. Now, if you want me to run this for you, you let me run it for you. I got them here. I won't see them abused. I won't see anybody taken advantage of. You understand? Who do you think I'm Everyone, now you've got people waiting for two and a half hours and you, you won't stop getting footage on this group here. You've got enough footage, okay? Now you've got people that have been standing around here, very good, well-known people waiting out there. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, just be organized and do it my way, okay? Or don't do it. 
So now can we start with the same as I'm serious? Room 41, please. Andre Hala. Andre, it's, uh, it's Nick Broomfield here. Yeah, I know there were a lot of problems uh, yesterday with the callback, but I, you know, my feeling really is that this is not our, it was certainly not the film crew's fault. You know, I've, I, I learned that Harold Porter and was thinking of resigning it. And get that camera out of my face, I'm serious. Get that fucking camera. I don't think giving uh, flowers to people in that situation would make any difference. Andre, the principle of the matter was that it was a misrepresentation. People were, in fact, not being truly auditioned for the show. They were being filmed for the film. And that's what people are pissed off about. And that's something I don't feel I'm to blame for. You, you intend to announce to all the dancers and choreographers that the film will be cancelled as of Monday. Well, I think you should talk to Andrew Brownsburg first. I will certainly call him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm yarding, 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 The situation is now desperate. It had been Andre's idea originally to make up that the callbacks were for the show, but now he describes himself as a man fighting to climb up the mountain of his dreams. He says at the other end of the rope, however, is the wretched film crew preventing him from getting to the top. Now he says he has no option but to cut the rope. Michaela thinks we are equally wrong, Andre for having the idea and us for going along with it. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Nick. Well, I had a long talk to this big Scott, and uh, he had sent a letter to Andre last night saying to stop the film. Here's the following things that are upsetting. Big Scott considers that, you know, our film people have said fuck you to him and have ignored him from the beginning, which is true and which is stupid that we did that. Uh, secondly, uh, he's complaining about this incident on Friday, this whole callback business. Thirdly, there's the business of the release. And fourthly, he describes you as somebody who agrees with it, what he says and goes out and says you haven't listened to him at all. And that you're running like a bulldozer over everybody and you're blowing out the lights and the circuits. They want us to evacuate the building, etc., etc. Well, yeah, well, obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm actually just trying to direct the film. I'm not, I mean, although I employ the people who light it, I'm not lighting it myself. Yeah, we've blown the fuse. The, yeah, we blew the fuses continuously for one day. Well, that's very bad. You're going to disturb everybody else in the building. Well, it was very bad, but I mean... Yeah, well, we can't do that. No, of course we can't. Do we need a generator? Well, we're tied in in the end. I mean, it was unfortunate. I did clear it, and I, Dick Scott happened to be there at the you time. Is it going to be okay from now on? Yeah, it will be absolutely fine from now on. And, and unfortunately, Mercedes got swatted on the head by the camera, which wasn't very helpful either. Uh, but then, of course, she ran into the camera as much as the camera ran into her. Yeah, I know, but it's not to us to be invisible. Right. You know, I mean, the thing is that uh, I'm going to fix it tonight somehow by spreading a little bit of cash around. And, you know, I'm going to try anyway. Right. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming I'm going to be able to fix it this time. I mean, I think from Andre's point of view, and he said it several times, you know, the most important thing to him is obviously the show. and. He needs to feel he's loved, and clearly, you know, the, the film is something very expendable, so it's very the first thing he's going to dump. Yeah, exactly, of course, and he's getting a little freak. He was very freak when I talked to him yesterday. I mean, his solution always seems to be to give everyone flowers, and I, you know, told him I didn't think that that was to do with it. No, yeah, well, what he means is to charm. And I understand that I'm going to have to charm Scott, you know. Unfortunately, your charm has run out. <laughs> Yes. Besides, they look at you with great suspicion. Why is that? I wonder. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I hope the old silver tongue works. Oh, yeah. I hope so, too. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to spread a bit of money around. Spread a bit of, yes. Yeah. Well, I feel slightly wrecked, Andrew. Do you? Well, yeah, because it was... Well, I was surprised how hysterical Andre was, and, and the whole thing so, seemed so crazy. Well, he's under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, that's why. Okay, well, look, good luck. And also, you know, it may have been something else. He just had to lash out on somebody. The joys of filmmaking. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you expect the success of this film? Were you surprised? Um, gosh, I, I have to say, I haven't seen it for so long, so it's um, quite uh, as surprising uh, to, for me to, to see it as anyone. Um, I was really just doing a kind of diary, I would say, when I was, when I was making it. Um, and I think it became uh, something that was so typical of so many shows or so many films that you go through these agonizing uh, moments that are normally not in the film. Um, and in a way, it was an incredible indulgence to do it. But it was also something that uh, I think was very much about the process of creation. It's just all these people, all these egos, all these, this passion uh, so bottled up together um, and, and it, uh, it happens an awful lot. And it also, I think, pointed to me that sometimes the process of making a film is as important as anything. And in looking at the process, you understand so much more about the subject. And, uh, and it also meant that it, it made things much more accessible. Uh, you, you, you were there, to, you know, to to really make a a portrait of your experience and that event, and um, in so doing, you get a very intimate portrait of those people and that time. Um, and so later, I, I mean, driving me crazy was. I was amazed it ever got finished, actually. I thought, I thought it was just something that would end up under my bed somewhere that I would look at, you know, many, many years later. But it was, uh, it was a film that actually resonated. It was shown on television. And then when I came to making probably, in a way, more serious films like The Leader, I was able to use so much that I'd learned on Driving Me Crazy. It was a very important seminal film for me to make. And I have to confess, as a filmmaker, um, there were two or three times in my filmmaker's life when I felt really low after dealing with producers and things like that, and I watched this film, and um, I, 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 kind of for me it's a feel-good movie. It's like <laughs> such an inspiring film. Um, you talked about the leader, and that's uh, we're going to show a clip from the leader right now. Um, uh, so, uh, this is the film, uh, for the people who have seen uh, My Father and Me, um, uh, the, the, with the extremists, uh, um, the, the white supremacists in um, South Africa. So, we're, we're going to run that clip. Number uh, six. I'm very sorry that we've taken this. I'm not making the move, 
I'm not fighting the fellow. I'm preparing my people for a fight. You don't do it to me. Well, we won't. So we're keen. Yeah, oh, yes, you won't. Because you will have tonight what you are looking for, and then you'll go out. You'll move out. So let's finish it. And uh, let's stop it. This is about you. I'm very sorry that we were 10 minutes late. Oh, us. Stop it. I'm, I'm not accepting your, your apology. You were late. And I listened to that man, Mr. Mr. Mayor. He said he, if you are late, no interview. Yet you chose to be late. If I'm not so important that you are on time, why the hell was I discussed with you anything? Where were you? Where were you at the time when you was when you should be arrived at my place? Where were you? Well, I think we were actually five minutes late. Mr. Mr. Yes, five minutes is enough, man. Where were you then at quarter past twelve? Tell me. I heard him. I, I, at that stage, I I was busy with a meeting, and I heard him say, "If you are late, stop it." Well, we then so I ran from the city hall. To the office, and you were not yet. I was in time, but you were late. Well, we were then told to come back at one, which we did. And that is not the point. The point is, you were late. Who are so important that you people were late? Tell me. Well, we then came back at six. No, who were so important that you were late? Well, five minutes late. Who were so important that you were five minutes late? Tell me. Give me the name of the man. He must be a hell of an important man. Who was it? I think we were actually just, uh, were we getting some tea? Well, that's good. I think it's, we were getting yeah, some tea. Yeah, it's tea and dinner is better than a man. They thought you, well, was, you used up my time for somebody else. So you well, have, all we can do is uh, say that we're sorry. We you waited a lot of time to try to anything you. like I will always remember it. This is our land. This is Africa. And I will move. But I will never accept it. Because I will never do it to you. Because my food program, I will never ever do it to you. But yet you did it to me. What do you want from me? Well, we wanted to ask you some questions about... Yeah, you can ask me questions, yes. What? Mm, extraordinary scene. Um, it's, uh, you set him up. I mean, you delib you're deliberately late there. Yes. Uh, because I was, I was worried um, because Normally in South Africa at that time, people who were interviewing to Blanche would come out from Johannesburg to Ventersdorp, which is a small little town where he was living, and they would ask him questions and uh, publish his interviews the next day in the newspapers, and in a way gave him a political platform, uh, because they weren't really revealing the kind of man he was. And I was living in Ventersdorp. We, we were great friends with the driver who lived next to, uh, to Blanche, the leader. And he was a man who, you know, beat his wife, who was a terrible drunk, who had a terribly mean temper. He could just sort of fly off the handle over no real reason at all. Uh, and, you know, of course, later on was uh, found guilty for you know, murdering various people in the township and beating up uh, a, a guy who served petrol in the gas service station and was sent to prison and then he was uh, eventually murdered by two of his farmhands. They macheted him to pieces. So, but, and although none of that had happened or not all of that had happened, there was this sort of very crazy side to him. Uh, with his terrible temper, 
And, and I wanted to find a way to reveal more of that side of him because I felt that that was uh, much more accurate to who he was than to have him coming up with a, a whole lot of sort of racist uh, stuff about uh, Mandela. And it was just when Mandela was coming out of prison, uh, it was just when there was going to be majority rule in South Africa and uh, to Blanche and his supporters were kind of creating terrible mayhem to try and disrupt that process. So yes, we were deliberately late because I knew just being five minutes late for tea would drive him absolutely crazy and he would then uh, reveal that kind of hectoring, bullying side that was the thing which was kind of, in a way, his final undoing. Uh, and so we, you know, we very, and we wanted him to know that that was why we were late, uh, rather than, you know, so, um, I, you know, I remember when we came back and the film was shown on uh, British television, some people criticized the interview, you know, they said, well, this was a real opportunity to ask him about his politics and his views and so on. But I always felt it was more of an opportunity to reveal the real man, to reveal, you know, the, uh, the kind of rather dislocated man that he was. It became, so, so that was really the thinking behind the interview. And, and it actually gets, the interview gets worse and worse, in fact. Uh, so, yeah. I, I, I think sometimes as a filmmaker, you're, you're a provocateur too. You, you kind of enable that person to reveal their complete self, you know. And that's really what, what we, did, we did with the, that particular interview. Well, that leads us nicely into the next clip that I want to show, which is the um, trailer for Tracking Down Maggie. Um, uh, you provoked her a few times, but she didn't quite respond. Um, can we play trick no, um, clip number seven? Sorry. A new target in his sights. Film director Nick Broomfield wants to know ex-premier Margaret Thatcher a little better. Can I ask exactly what you're filming? What makes her smile? I don't think she has any sense of humor. What about her family? She is so devoted to this quite unattractive individual. What's on her mind? Yeah, don't give up, do you? No. What does she talk about? You're told no press. Out. So you're pursuing um, Thatcher for an interview, um, and you chase her the whole film, but she never kind of agrees to talk to you. Um, it's kind of an interesting question that I want, I, I kind of like came to my mind, it's like when someone says no, should no mean no, when a, when a person that you want to make a film about, they say no. You don't take no for an answer, do you? <laughs> well, I think sometimes no is uh, more revealing than if they said yes, and, and then you want to find out what things they particularly don't want to talk about. I, th I always think uh, people reveal themselves more about the things they don't want to uh, have filmed or discussed than they do with the things that they are happy to have filmed. So um, Margaret Thatcher had, had an enormous effect on all our lives. Um, uh, this was at a period actually when, she'd, when she had just resigned finally. Uh, but she had sort of changed the whole political landscape in England from a, a rather sort of paternalistic Tory party um, after the Second World War, where there was a sort of real belief in um, looking after the, you know, I, I think after the Second World War, there was a belief in the Tory party of looking after the people who had fought in the war. And Margaret Thatcher drew a line through those policies. And, and I think more than anything, I wanted to examine that 
person that who had 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 such a radical effect on politics. Great. Um, we're going to swiftly move to Heidi Fleiss, Hollywood Madame, and. Um, this is a, 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 a very I, I, another personal favorite of mine. It's such a good film. Um, it's populated with characters that um, are straight out of um, Raymond Chandler's set of novels, and this is a kind of like a, a proper investigation that you're you're doing, trying to find out what has really happened there and who these people are. Um, let's play clip number eight. Then, knocking at the door, comes these two prostitutes that he asked the doorman to get him, the, bell, the room service guy. They are both about 40 and about, I don't know, I'm normal weight, so I'd say about 70 to 80 pounds more than I, what I weigh with folds, and he wanted to see them do the lesbian thing, and for us to watch, and I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm not. When they took their clothes off, it was like, Heidi's mentor into the business was Madame Alex, the grand madam who ruled Hollywood for about 20 years. Madame Alex now lives in this little house in West LA. This room is Madame Alex's world now. She rarely leaves it. She spends her time taking phone calls on her bed. Where's your work? So how shall we interview you? Really? Wait, 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 wait. You think in your bed? Is that your favorite place? Well, I think it because I'm near the phone. Do you get lots of phone calls? All the time. I have nothing to do with this business either. I know it is. No more girls? No. Could you introduce us to any of... Uh, no, I can't do that. No. They wouldn't want anyone to know about their lives. I told you that too, that they don't want anyone to know anything about the business. It's a very secretive business. Secretive? That's where Ivy aired. And she kept a, a big secret. She would have been very successful. She was a flamboyant about them. Flamboyant? Oh man, yes. Drop names, talk about people. You don't do that in this business, you know? That's, that's what you people are here for. You want to find out what you can reveal about Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't want to be revealed. You want to continue in their merry way. And you don't blame them for that, especially now, it's very critical. Before, everybody viewed it with some humor. I wanted to know how Heidi had got into the business. Always on the phone from the age of 23. These are Heidi's parents, Dr. Paul Fleiss, a well-respected pediatrician, and Alyssa, a school teacher. One of six children, this is a picture of the Fleisses outside their Los Feliz home in Los Angeles. Heidi the ringleader in the middle. The Fleisses on a painted donkey in Mexico. All the Fleisses underwater. Heidi again in the middle with her brother and sister. It seemed like a great childhood. Some say it was this man, Yvonne Nage, Heidi's lover for many years, who actually introduced Heidi to the business. Did uh, Yvonne Nage introduce you to Heidi? He brought her to the house. He sold her to me for 450 because that's what she owed him. And I said to him at the time, Heidi's a very nice girl. She's not even a five. How do you mean a five? Rating her from one to 10. She barely makes it. To five. That's what I would say. And I said, how can you bring me this? Furthermore, she didn't have any style. She was wearing those raggedy jeans and t-shirt. And her hair wasn't fixed. It looked like it hadn't been washed in ages. She looked like my affectionate name for her, my little ragazzi. Little ragazzi. <laughs> and I taught her a little bit of fixing herself. And uh, she had a way with men. Men liked her. So how long did she work for you? 
maybe 18 months and then she went on her own. And even that he had in mind, she didn't know it then, that he plotted to make her learn ropes so that she could steal the business. And he was telling her how much he loved her. And then to hear him tell on TV, he didn't know she was hooping. How wouldn't he know she was hooping? He made her a hooker. She wasn't a hooker when he met her. She was a little groupie hanging out at a club called Elena's. Helena's. That was all she was, and she was cute, good personality. And he came on like young busters, he loved her, he loved her, and all that spiel. <laughs> That's such a sophisticated piece of filmmaking. I mean, every time I see it, I see something, something um, more as another layer. Um, mm. So all the tabloids were after Heidi's black book, which contained the clients that she had for the girls, but you were not interested in that. You, you wanted to kind of like focus on these people. Yes, uh, it was like a little dysfunctional family. Um, there was Heidi uh, and her sort of surrogate parents were kind of Madame Alex and Ivan Naj, this much older Hungarian gentleman. Um, and uh, I think, you know, Heidi came from a fairly rarefied background and entered into this very kind of rough world of L.A. and, and uh, it was really just a, a portrait really of those people and they were all incredible storytellers who never really told the truth. Uh, the truth was somewhere in between all their stories. And so it was a very circular story that we were telling and one would go from one to the other and they would always slightly contradict each other and i wondered if an audience would be interested enough to sort of pick up the lies and work out the truth uh, and it actually worked very well on that level yeah it was ver very much a portrait of this dysfunctional group of people and so and it was also a kind of dysfunctional love story between heidi and ivan who even though they proclaimed such dislike and hatred for each other, were still seeing each other uh, in the afternoons, but were desperate that no one should realize that they were still lovers. So it was very, uh, it was a very odd experience making it. And it was also somewhere where I was surprised. It was the nearest I think I ever made uh, a sort of documentary fiction film about these people. It was kind of like a, a drama, uh, but it was a documentary drama, and, and, but it had all the ingredients of a proper scripted drama in a sense. So it was very interesting to make it. I, you know, uh, it's, it's just surprising where you can go with documentary. There's this purist idea in some documentary circles that you should not pay your contributors. And we've seen, we see you there paying, you're making that part of the payment, part of the film. Um, yeah. I mean, why did you accept sort of like their demands for payments? Well, because in that particular world, everybody values themselves on how much money they can get. I mean, that's, I guess, the central part of prostitution is that your, your every, every relationship is assessed by how much money it could bring in. And so I felt that that was an essential part of the portrait of that world. You know, for example, Madame Alex was absolutely, the thing that made Al Madame Alex really annoyed was that I paid Heidi more money than she got, you know, and it, it was just that Heidi would get, was worth more than she was. So uh, you have to find a way of incorporating that in the film, if, if that's what 
your subjects regard as the most important aspect. I, I was talking about sort of sophisticated filmmaking and all these little details like in the edit, um, uh, you, you're showing some stills of Heidi since you were a child and then you, he, you kind of, when they're diving, you hear the bubbles and you hear the, <laughs> the voices of the children and it brings it all to life and it so mm, makes it... Um, yeah, it was... Sorry. It was fun doing all that, I remember, finding that treasure trove of pictures. Um, and I think they were a really fun family, uh, but uh, Heidi's family, and I got to know her brother and her sister and her mother, I never, uh, and the father, the, but they were oddly dysfunctional and um, th they had quite sad endings, some of them. I'm still in touch with Heidi, um, e even all these years later, because I made the film and I think it's set in 96. 95, 96, and um, we still occasionally have dinner and stuff together, uh, which is which is nice. But uh, yes, a very sort of quite a dysfunctional family in a way that she comes from, which is very sad because I I like the family too. I mean, there are moments in the films when it's quite clear that Heidi likes you and you like her. There's this kind of chemistry mm. on screen. Flirtation, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, how important is it to like your characters? Well, I think, um, I think it's important, if it's one of your main characters, to at least share humor with them, to be amused by each other. I always feel as a filmmaker, you don't want to bore the people that you're filming. You want to add some sparkle to their lives. So, because they're giving you so much, you want to give something back. You want to amuse them in some way or uh, make their life somewhat richer, you know. And, and I think if there's that uh, transfer, uh, it makes the film so much stronger. You know, you have to be. It's like, I don't know if people saw Grim Sleeper, but, uh, you know, we became very good friends with Pam, who, you know, had worked the streets and been on crack. Uh, but she loved hanging out with me, and actually I shot that with my son, Barney. Um, and we're still great friends, but her love for us, in a sense, may absolutely made the film. Uh, so I think you need that. You know, you need to have a some communication or other, which, you know, and, and the stronger the better, really. I mean, that doesn't mean that you end up in bed with your subjects. It just means that there is a connection. Um, also, the, the way you interview Madam Alex, I love that. I mean, you, 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 you don't say much, you just repeat the last word of what she says, and that prompts her to go on and on and on. Um, I've worked a little bit in the last year as a therapist, and I, I, you know, I now fully understand the value of that, just like the minimalism and the right thing. It's like just repeating the last word of your of of the, of the subject, and and that gives them. You know, yes, them. it's almost like you're entering into someone's mind, and particular words will trigger a particular response. I mean, sometimes I listen to interviews that people have done with other journalists or whatever, and there are certain words that they use, and if you can find a way of using them when you're asking questions, it triggers the same response, and you can, you know, our minds are so much like a computer, I guess, you know, it's, a, it's like a color or a word or an association, and then people go down that path. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Talking of interviews, um, I would like to show um, the next clip um, from Kurt and Courtney. Um, it's clip number 10, and you're interviewing here um, Hank, who's Courtney's father. Um, mm. And th th this is an amazing scene. Um, clip number 10. But the person I had the biggest problem understanding was Hank, Courtney's father. I wondered why he hadn't tried to support and defend his daughter. 
Here we are again, Cinema Verite. How are you? No time to talk, just filming. Good, fine. How are you? Good. Got a nice car this time. Yeah, we, you know, BBC does its best. Yeah, well, I didn't get any of it, but that's okay. I asked him if it was true he got Rottweilers to discipline Courtney as a child. No, pit bulls. Pit bulls. Yeah, no, originally, this was way back in 1982, when I first got to pit bulls, it was primarily to put some peace into our house. Uh, I got the dogs because uh, I liked that particular kind of dog. But you said it was... And then when Courtney came around, she wouldn't play with the dogs anymore, and she never came back after that. So it did the job that it was supposed to do, and that it was designed so that Courtney would have to either learn to deal with these kinds of dogs and me, because that's my kind of, you know, they say people are like their dogs. Yeah, they're kind of a pit bull. Yeah. But I mean, but then maybe it's not surprising that you and Courtney don't have such a great relationship. No, but I told her what the rules were, tough love rules. She was a minor. She couldn't smoke in the house. She couldn't do heroin. She couldn't turn tricks and she couldn't bring her weird heroin buddies around anymore. Those are the rules I laid down, but she was welcome there any time, and she broke every one of those rules right away. That's what she was only 16, 17. So the reason she's alienated from me is because of the, quote, tough, tough love that we tried to use on yeah, her. But she's not going to like you anymore with all the theories, you know, that she might somehow be involved in Kurt's death and stuff. Well, I'm not in the business of getting Courtney to love me or even like me. I'm in the business of trying to look out for my granddaughter and myself. But, I mean, I just, it, it, I, I don't know, it just seems strange that, you know, with one's own daughter, that you wouldn't want to have. Well, I do. I mean, I would like to have a relationship with Courtney. But it but just seems you're going about it in a, just a strange way. Yeah, it is. It's very strange. I admit that it's very strange, and most people don't understand it. But what course well, have I, I got? I don't understand it really either. No. What course have I got? Ask yourself, what course is open to me? There is no other course. She has made it the escalated battle. I have not. There's been many... Well, no, but I mean, the two of you are kind of at war. Yeah, it's a great so, war, and I hope the public watches it. I want the public to yeah, see... Yeah, but, but what's the point? I mean, oh, she's your daughter. Well, but uh, husbands and daughters... I mean, you saw the War of the Roses. You've seen husbands and wives yeah, fighting. You've what? seen daughters and fathers and sons and daughters and fathers. You know, families fight all the time. Why, what, why isn't our feud as interesting as the Hatfields and the McCoys? It's a family feud. It happens to be a public family feud. It's a fairly incredible state of play. Well, you know, when, when someone's father, own father, is saying that maybe his daughter is a, is a murderer. That's or correct. Arrest That's, That's correct. Particular. That's correct. Instead of saying, look, if you've got a problem, you know, maybe I can help you with it. Or maybe... I have done know. that. That's all been done. Those are exhausted remedies that have been taken care of or exhausted long, long ago. Those are remedies that were exhausted long, long ago. And there's no chance in the world that those are going to be patched up. But is this the best way of... Telling her you love her. No, I'm not telling her I love her. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying what are to you say, trying to say to her? I got her number hanging. I got her figured out. She can't get away. I got her nailed. That's what I'm trying to say. It's still tough love, and I'm still the father. Period. Cop out to me. Maybe we can work something out. But stop. keep on bad rapping me. I'll keep kicking your ass. I told her that from the beginning. I'll keep kicking your ass. Don't take me on. I'll kick your ass. I don't care how big a show it is. I don't care if you go $177 million. I'll kick your ass because of one Achilles heel that she had. I know how she thinks. I know how she works inside. I've got an inside track on her mind, her mindset. You can take all the LSD and do all the cosmetic surgery you want. You can't fool me because I know what her next thought's going to be. But the information that I... Hmm. Amazing. I mean, this is documentary gold. Yeah. Um, Were well, you aware of it when it kind of, immediately after the interview did you kind of say to yourself, "This is this is it. <laughs> it's brilliant." <laughs> well, it's say it's. I have to be say I'm very grateful to you for show because I haven't watched these for so long, and it <laughs> is an amazing, yeah, it's an incredible interview. And what a what a. Uh, incredibly strange relationship he and Courtney have, um, which I, I think goes to explaining an awful lot. Um, but yes, it was a very strange world that we entered with uh, Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love and, uh, and, and the film, of course, caused an awful lot of trouble um, you know, it was, it got into Sundance Film Festival and then 
uh, a, the day before the festival started, I got a phone call from uh, the New York Post, page four, saying, how does it feel when your film is thrown out of Sundance the day before the festival? And I said, I didn't know that. Well, hey, you, you, this is news. Thank, thanks for telling me. Especially uh, when you're in you the know, jury. It was the year I was on the jury at Sundance Zoo. So it was just a complete uh, mud bath up there, you know. And Sundance is actually quite a conservative Hollywood mainstream festival, um, despite its reputation of being, uh, you know, very progressive. And, it, you know, and, and Courtney was well represented by her... Uh, publicist Pat Kingsley who was also the publicist for Robert Redford so it was you know it was a kind of inside job and I, I learned an awful lot about Sundance and Hollywood and the film and who my real friends were uh, with that particular you know incident but um, yeah at the, at the time it always seems awful that you're never going to get through it um, but I, I, it was a very important film, one way or another. I, it was kind of a miracle it ever got out. Um. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to another important film, and this is um, actually the last clip that I'm going to show tonight. It's the Eileen, uh, The Life and Death of a Serial Killer. And um, you made the first film about Eileen in 1990, was it one or two? Uh, and then you went... Uh, yes, right. Yeah, and then... Um, or 93, I think sorry. 90, 93. Was it? Okay. Yeah, it was released in 93. And then in, 10 years on, you kind of go back, and <coughs> just before she's being um, executed, you interview her. And um, you appear, you testify in court. You're called to testify in court, because now you're film plays, is a piece of evidence in this kind of trial. Um, shall we watch the, the clip and then discuss it? Yes. Or do you want to say anything else before the... No, 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 let's yeah. watch the clip. Okay, brilliant. Um, cl clip number 12, please. Prali, the born-again Christian. Hired Steve and persuaded Eileen to come clean with God and plead guilty. Steve had been advised that Eileen was paranoid and suffered from borderline personality disorder, but still went along with his cockeyed scheme. Eileen seemed to think a miracle might happen and was outraged to receive three more death sentences. I sentence you to death for the murder of Charles Humphreys. Case number 91-112, Citrus County case number. I sentence you to death for the murder of David Spears. Thank you, and uh, probably see, uh, I'll be up in heaven while y'all are rotting in hell. Okay, there will be an automatic appeal. You have the right to an appeal. Mr. Glazer, is that going to be handled by you? Yeah, your wife and kids get raped. I would ask that they would find the attorney's office. I know I was raped. You weren't nothing but a bunch of skunk. Therefore, these proceedings are now completed. Putting somebody who was raped to death or a victim. In many death row cases, a client in despair will say they want to die. It was a measure of Steve the lawyer's inexperience that he took Eileen's wish on face value. I like to flatter myself that I was being asked for my legal opinion, but it turned out I was there to talk about Steve's marijuana smoking. The big question was whether Steve had consumed seven very strong joints before giving Eileen legal advice in prison. You know, I've got a short video clip I want to show, if I may. It's an excerpt from the film that depicts this alleged six, seven joint ride. And as a preliminary question, isn't it true that in doing your work, you routinely edit things, correct? Well, you always edit afterwards, yeah. Because editing involves cutting and pasting and putting things together, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And that's what you do all the time. 
I don't know about the pasting, but you certainly can't. Well, pasting in terms of inserting and connecting and making things fit together. Correct. Okay. It was 6 a.m. Steve said it was a seven joint ride to the prison, and he brought along a tape of his own music with him singing and playing all the instruments, especially for the occasion. Distinctly, the, I mean, the seven joint right, if that's what you're referring to. I don't remember him changing his shirt, but we could, if you want, we can make all the outtakes available from that particular journey. Because oh, they're, still, they're still available. Right now, and you hadn't made those available before. Well, I didn't know you wanted them before. And I, you know, I didn't even know that the film was going to be submitted as evidence. If I was making that trip, I would probably change my shirt at the end of the trip. I don't know about you. That, that's not the point of my question, is it? I don't know, but I would, I would probably bring a clean shirt along for my visit. <coughs> and clean you, I would. Yes. <laughs> I got a message that Eileen wanted me to come meet her at the local jail. She had something to say. It actually works. <laughs> okay, Nick. Nick, this this interview, man. I got to. I, I I just let me do this thing over one more time because I know you guys pre-tape and you clip and stuff. Right. So let me say it one more time, kind of right, okay? Because okay. I'm really concerned about the family members. Right. <clears throat> I gotta get my hair out of my face while I'm doing this. Because I'm really concerned about the family members. So I want to say this again, over. Um, Nick, the reason I'm, I'm coming forth with you with this interview is because I like to come clean about my cases and because there's only about 1% chance that a person can get off death row. And I come to realize that that is actually true. Very, very true. There's only like about 82 people that got off death row after, in, in like 30 years out of uh, like about four or 5,000 death row inmates. It, and those are only DNA people, blood sample. So the chances of getting off death row are 1%, 999.9% you're going to be on it and you're going to die. Okay, 
I cannot go in the execution chamber and die in the execution chamber as a liar. And I cannot go in the execution chamber and be executed under the devil. I have to come clean and clean, cleanse my spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so I have to come clean and tell the world the lies that went on through my mouth. I mean, the, now prosecutors and well, the cops. And that you, and that you killed those men. Huh? That you killed those men in cold blood. Yeah, and i got to come clean that I killed those seven men in first degree murder and robbery. As they said, they had it right. A serial killer. Not so much like thrill kill. I was into the robbing business. I mean, you know, serial killers are in this thrill killing jazz. I was into the robbing just and eliminate a witness. But still then again, I got a number, so it's serial killer. But I'm coming clean before I go in that execution chamber and be executed that uh, I killed them. And like so this. when you met them from the beginning, did you know that you were gonna kill them? When they picked you up in their cars? I pretty much <clears throat> I pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were gonna die. But when you're saying that um, there was no self-defense, so there was no self-defense. No, there was no self-defense. Uh, I'm being really straight up about mm -hmm. everything. There's no self-defense. I'm really sorry what happened about everything. I, I was in, in this, this, to me, this world is nothing but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another in whatever we do. We have evil in us, all of us do. And my evil would just happen to come out because of the circumstances of what I was doing. Hitchhiking, hooking, mm -hmm. on the road. I was a homeless person all my life. And then the hitchhiking, hooking, I learned off the homelessness and, and cruising all over the United States of America and stuff. And so learning how to be a hooker as a hitchhiker. Right eventually got tiring in the end. I carried the gun for protection, but then I got where I was getting a real problem and our rent was due $1,200 behind. The Tyra was doing a lot of beer drinking and stuff. She wanted to go out all the time, so she was burning up the money I was making. I, I was making good, about two, 300 a day, sometimes. sometimes did she, and did she know what you were doing? Oh yeah, Tyra. This is an Hi. extraordinary film. <laughs> um, where is the truth? <laughs> you keep kind of asking yourself as you're watching the film, where does this truth sort of lie? Mm. Is she sane? Is she not? Yeah, did she, did she murder in self-defense or would, was she just murdering them to conceal evidence? And eliminate witnesses, yeah. Well, then there's that incredible scene where uh, she thinks we've run out of film and she says uh, that she she did kill uh, Richard Mallory in self-defense um, but she only says that because she I think by the end of her life was determined to be executed because she couldn't stand being on death row anymore and she realized she wasn't ever going to get out. Um, but I guess as, as a filmmaker and as somebody who kind of believed in her and somebody who was a, her witness and everything, uh, uh, you know, talking on her behalf in court, I obviously, you know, wanted to know whether she had at some point when she started killing, killed in self-defense or... Uh, so that was, in, in a sense, what I needed to know. And I guess what an audience who, because I think people become very fond of Eileen in the making of this film. I think the audience want to know too whether she was really a killer or whether she was an unfortunate victim of a terrible upbringing where she was sort of raped by her brother and her grandfather and all these awful life that she had and that she initially killed out of self-defense um, so in a sense that was the that was a very important part of the film for me to 
to work that out. I think it was Colin Young that said that documentaries are evidence. And it's interesting that um, you gather more and more evidence to tell the full story. You, you return to this story because you felt that there was... In fact, actually, you even kind of end up in court, literally with the film as evidence um, yeah. of um, what has happened to her and how he got, she got there. Um, Nick, thank you so much. Um, it's a Thank you so much for this, this, this wonderful masterclass. Um, we've got very little time, so, but we're going to take one or two questions from the audience, if that's okay. 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 Is there anyone who has a question? Yeah. The lady over there. We've got someone with a roving phone as well. Oh, okay. We, so you can see who's asking the question. Just Hello, move good the evening. The arrow. It would have been better to have you in person than I'm... I hope you, <laughs> you're feeling well with COVID and stuff. And uh, you mentioned earlier in this masterclass that you prepared yourself for coming to Romania, like learning something about Sibiu and our literature and stuff, and knowing that you have a specific interest in controversial things is there anything that um, drew your attention on Romania enough to make a documentary on it? So is there a story here for you? Well, I'm sure there's so many uh, amazing stories. I really just, I read the, the, the novel by Herta Muller um, about the, the camps and that kind of thing. But uh, it, that's just a starting point, and there were so many. And I, of course, I looked at uh, the work of Livu, uh, you know, the New Gypsy Kings, and and some of the Roma films. But um, that was just because I felt I wanted to know something rather than just arriving in your country and uh, just like a complete tourist. But I was just starting, really, and of course, I hope to spend. The better part of a week with you all and uh, to look at the city properly and uh, uh, Livu was offering us a tour uh, we were going to go on a tour around and look at lots of things so um, it's unfortunate but I'm certainly interested and I you know every I think it's a starting point uh, I I'm a, of course incredibly sit uh, curious about your city. Um, I looked at some shots of the buildings you're in um, late this afternoon and some of the city around where you are sitting. It just looks incredible. So I'm going to have to arrange another time to come. I'm just so sorry not to be there. And I, I think I would have learned so much. And it's such a incredible culture that you come from, right in the center of Europe. Um, how can it not be absolutely fascinating? So maybe okay. next, Thank next you. time. Um, I there, hope so. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, there. Uh, Toby. Me? Um, yes, okay. Oh, no, could, you, could you give it to Toby, please? You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hi, Nick. Um, thanks so much for doing this. I just had a question about my father and me. It was, it was the first time I saw it, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned several times throughout the film that you, uh, as a younger man or as a child, you didn't really... Uh, Approve or um, yeah, approve of your father's view of uh, English um, I yeah, industry and the way that his photos depict that. But that obviously changed. And I was wondering, you do kind of go over what you do. You do say that that changed, and I wonder why you think that changed. You allude to Th Thatcher coming in and destroying British um, industry. But was it, was it that, or do you think it was something personal between you and your father which changed the way you 
that, that you viewed his work? Well, I, I think uh, certainly, you know, he used to take me into the factories, uh, which I always thought were like the most terrifying places I've ever been to because you couldn't hear anything and there were terrible smells and it was just like, it was before health and safety, so it was kind of terrifying. Um, and I always felt that his pictures were kind of glorifying something that was not very glorious at all. It was just like, uh, thank God my life won't be spent in a factory. But then I think, you know, if you go back to these places like Derby, which is where he was from, or Nottingham or Sheffield, so many of them are cities, you know, without a center. And you realize that the factories uh, were also the kind of social center of the town. So they had these, you know, social clubs, people met their future husbands and wives there. Um, it gave people a sense of being and a purpose. Um, I, I realized that, you know, they, they also fulfilled a function that I hadn't thought of earlier. And also I felt that his photographs um, celebrated probably the achievements of the working person. They weren't, um, yeah, I probably was more political in that sort of like, uh, the workers are exploited and they, you know, that was my immediate reaction. Then I realized that his photographs were a very beautiful memory too of the, of some of the triumphs of the working person, what they, what they had created and what they were doing. Right. Thank, does, thank that make, does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I thought they were very dignifying. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, last question, um, Mihai. Hi, Nick. Uh, watching your uh, movies, I remember R.D. Lang, the Scottish psychiatrist or other anti-psychiatrist uh, parent, uh, father, one of the figure, iconic figure of uh, counterculture in the 60s. Uh, his book, uh, famous book, Politics of Experience, that asserts uh, uh, very, uh, that everything is very deep, deeply personal, is deeply political also. And I feel this in your, in your films. How do you reconcile your, uh, your view so personal, so, uh, so akin to tragic uh, existential dramas, and uh, in a way uh, Dionysian and Bohemian, how do you reconcile that with the rigorous uh, lens of the investigator, of the journalist, in this age where the media discourses are so uh, captured by ideological camps? You, you, you have such a special way to transcend the walls of prejudice, uh, to understand and uh, see the and have uh, sympathy and empathy and love for uh, even for uh, people that are might be well, considered think, disgraceful by the society. And yeah, well, I think uh, there's room for both, obviously. And I think the uh, journalistic investigations, I, I regret that there aren't more of them. I think there was a time when there were amazing programs like, um, you know, even 60 Minutes in America or World in Action in, in England that were very strong investigative programs that looked at things uh, and they were very expensive and they required incredible budgets and an amazing amount of research. And I think those kind of programs are always wanted and they're incredibly important in a democracy. Um, I think film is a medium that lends itself to emotion and to uh, a cert certain humanity and it creates a empathy in an audience. And so that's the side of uh, filmmaking that I have particularly been drawn to because I think when you move an audience and you touch their hearts, 
uh, it's something that stays with the audience. Um, it, it because I think it's it's the one thing that um, uh, is so special about film. And I think once you've made films and you're sitting in a cinema with an audience and you just know that people are being moved profoundly by the work and by the people that they're seeing on the screen, uh, there's nothing more wonderful than to have that experience. Thank you. Nick, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope that there will be an opportunity in the, in the future to, for you to be in CBU. And um, thank you for sharing with us your thoughts and your films. A big, big thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.